I'm so excited for today's conversation with Purr. My very special guest is Matt Purcell. Matt is one of Australia's leading entrepreneurs and you know how much I love speaking with entrepreneurs. Matt is also the recipient of the Outstanding Young Entrepreneur Award and was nominated for Australian of the Year. What an incredible feat for his work with the youth in our community. Matt is the co-founder of Mentored Media, representing some of the top brands and top personalities in Australia, and he is the founder of top podcast, The Examined Life. I love spending time with Matt because of his deep insight and his ability to become incredibly profound with his colourful stories and most enlightening perspectives. Matt has an honesty that touches me to the core and I can't wait to have this conversation with him today over a delicious cup of Tiger Pearl Chai. A question I've been wanting to ask you for a very long time, Matt. When was the last time you woke up really tired, looked at yourself in the mirror and realised that you were Asian? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, not long ago actually. I, I look in the mirror and just think, I don't know, I, I, I've got... Australian software, but Korean hardware, so I'm South Korean. But when I look at myself in the mirror, I'm like, oh, sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm Asian. Yes. <laughs> this is what I've got to work with. And five foot midget, I'm Asian. And, and if you close your eyes and you listen to my voice, I, I sound like some white dude. <laughs> um, I resonate. I resonate when I saw your social media post about that exact thing, I had a bit of a giggle because <laughs> I, I'm the same. And there are those who are quite um, trapped by the identity piece, mm. whereas I often, often forget that I'm Asian as well. It comes down to self-acceptance as well. Some people, particularly when you're younger, if you don't accept that, say you have Asian complexities and you're a certain height, you can be left quite vulnerable if people point it out. Oh, you're short. So, oh, back in the day when I was younger, I would have been, oh, that's, oh, I'm short. Oh. <laughs> when you accept that, you move past it pretty quickly. You're like, yeah, I don't really need to dwell on it. Yeah. Mm. So, you, South Korea, you were born there? I was born in South Korea. Yes. But I was adopted by my Australian parents uh, when I was about four months old. When did you realise that you were adopted? I, I was about four years old. Mm. when I realised I look nothing like my, like my parents. Yeah. <laughs> I realised I look like Jackie Chan's son <laughs> and my dad looks like Bill Clinton and my mum looks like Hillary. I'm like, what the hell? And I remember just asking them, hey guys, like, did you kidnap me? <laughs> <laughs> Something does not equate here. <laughs> this is science. And... They're like, nah, well, today's the day we've got to, we knew this day would come. You, we adopted you. We, mm. we couldn't have kids naturally and you were our answer to our prayers. Yeah. And I've, I've become very fond of the adoption process just because it really shows that you, a couple really want a child. What were your, um, what was growing up like? What were your feelings at the time? Uh, was it, I am so different, where do I belong? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Newcastle, so that's two hours north of Sydney, and it was a, it's, it's like a larger country town vibe. There wasn't a lot of Asian looking kids around in my area, and walking down the street or in the mall, people would give myself and my sister, who's adopted also, she's from Taiwan, uh, very strange looks because we'd be holding hands with two white Caucasian parents thinking the same thing, going, you kidnapping these kids <laughs> and it didn't bother me really until two things happened one was I went to school and kids started pointing out differences why don't you look like your parents and that just raised questions in my head like well why does that matter like it doesn't that just annoyed me and the second thing was when my parents separated when I was six mm. and that okay. really caused me to go really deep in myself and I moved house 13 times as a kid. I lived with my mother and she was a single mother for a long time of uh, a long time and she worked hard and yeah that that really made me think about my adoption a lot more. Mm. What were some of the challenges growing up? That's a um, intense time for a four to six year old boy. I think the biggest challenges growing up was I 
wasn't shielded as a kid from the realities of what happened with my mum. That they 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 overshared what happened. Right. So I didn't like them at all because my mother was like, "Your father did this," and my father was like, "Your mother did this." And right. I'm like, oh, "I don't like both of you. You guys are, are awful people." <laughs> and I started really thinking deeply about uh, subjects of identity, subjects yes. of identity. Where I didn't know who I was, and I would ask that question: "Who I? Who am I?" At the age of seven, and I was always found myself quite far removed from people my age. Mm. I found myself gravitating toward older people. Well, you've had to do a lot of accelerated growing up during the time, right? Mm. Yeah. So I connected deeply with older people mm -hmm. from a young age. So if you, if we followed me back at, in school, I was hanging with year six kids for, when I was in year two. So I was always hang, or hanging with, I was hanging and having conversations with school teachers, not people my own age. Purely wanted to figure out answers to my questions. And meaningful answers, mm. meaningful conversations, meaningful mm. questions. I, I resonate. I remember growing up uh, in the outer western suburbs of Cabramatta. I came to Australia when I was four, um, couldn't speak a word of English. I remember um, the teacher writing on the blackboard the alphabet. I knew it was something to do with letters and the alphabet, but it just wouldn't come out. Mm -hmm. That was the point where I knew that I was different. Um, when was the point for you as a child realizing you were different? And then when was the point for you as an adult realizing, hey, I'm different? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I think I, I realized no one was asking the questions I was asking at my young age. Mm. So I knew then I was either weird or very different. No, he was asking, who am I at age seven? Yeah. No one was asking that question. Seriously asking those questions and asking yeah. adults, what, what, what am I here to do? Like, mm. And I was trying to fill a hole that, I had a hole in my heart and my soul from knowing I was adopted and my family upbringing and having such changes. Like I was, I, some of the houses I grew up in were, had mold in it, you know, and all that yeah. so little boxes. So I was, I got, I had to learn to adapt. I could sleep on the floor if I had to. Like, I, that doesn't really bother me to this day. I'm not very picky with yeah. things. So I knew I was very different uh, from then. And then as I grew up, I was introduced to music and creativity. And that really became an outlet for these feelings because I didn't have anything before then, I was just in my head. It gave me something to be able to put it, get it out of my head and be able to share this and to yeah. make sense of it. Uh, with music particularly, it helped me. I wouldn't have nightmares anymore about the things I was going through. Yeah, mm. uh, that creative expression. I remember when um, I met you for the first time and we went to the back, uh, to the cut barber shop and you gravitated towards the guitar and mm -hmm. uh, I've listened to your music on Spotify. It's so lovely, so poetic. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about you. There's a, a deep sense of insight, um, of meaning, of um, creative expression. What does music mean to you? In, in, like most art, music to me is the embodiment the word made flesh in a way. So mm -hmm. whenever you say the word love, that's got to look like something. That's got to sound like something. Or it's an abstract thought. It's just an abstract idea. Uh, most of the concepts that we, we, we talk about, like gratitude and all these things, they have to look like something. Yeah. And that's what music to me is fleshing out of an idea, whether it be an angry idea or a profound experience that you've had and it's, it's, it's such an amazing thing. It's a time capsule, it's a time machine. And when you hear a song, your mind automatically goes back to an, a moment or an event and yeah. it just re-triggers it all. It's Evokes the emotion. It's yeah. incredible. We had dinner one time and you said, I am a creative genius. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I love that you just freaking owned it. <laughs> I am the creative genius. And uh, I do believe also that there's too much of this um, throwing around of the word um, humble, you know, be hum you know, humility. Humility comes from the word human ability. Mm. You know, the, the ability that we have as human beings to um, live our best version of ourselves and express 
express without holding back or being ashamed mm. and uh, especially in the professional field as well which was why I love that you own it in the professional field is you don't want to be too humble because you get overlooked and underpaid right yeah, yeah. and it ain't bragging if it's the truth it's true <laughs> it oh, ain't bragging that. Yeah. if it's true and so um, that creative expression with your music and the way you uh, I, I don't I don't believe you hold back in your music it, it comes from the heart it pulls at the heart strings what does all of that mean to you and how does that segue into your profession into your into your genius with what you do as well mm -hmm. well I, I, it's funny because a lot of people when they discover their gifts they may assume that everyone else else has that same instinct so part of the creative genius in me is that I'll learn something from martial arts yep. I'll learn something from music I'll learn something from filmmakers I'll learn something from architecture and be able to be able to pull the principles out of it and apply it to anything, especially in commercial sense. Mm. It's because it's that depth that I had as a child that has led me to ultimately steal, repurpose, collaborate and combine to make something truly unique for people yes. and for myself versus just copycatting whatever the best uh, competitor is of your business. It's about the combinations it's like food, right? It's like it's it's mixing their ingredients right together. It's like you're not recreating any new ingredients; they already exist. Yeah, and I love that. Oh, mm. That's one of the um, common themes that I have with a lot of my coaching clients as well, or my speaking clients when they say, "I don't have a story." or I'm not unique, I say, yes, but if you took a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of that of your direct experience mm. and you put all of those things together, no one else has that story but you. Mm. No one else has those uh, that combination of experiences uh, but you. Uh, and uh, the next step then is the courage mm. <laughs> to put it out there. <laughs> People can't see you if you're gonna remain invisible, right? Mm. Mm. Tell me about some of the challenges you have with your clients at Mentored Media. Yeah, well, I think a lot of people, either one, you're right, they believe that their story is boring and it's irrelevant. And, and two, they're just so, so close, they're not self-aware to be able to know what is their strengths, what are their weaknesses, and where is their uniqueness. The biggest mistake people make is they go, okay, I need to find my uniqueness. I'm just going to find whoever's done so who's ever been successful and just copy them. Yeah. And that's the biggest mistake. I mean, we don't build houses like that. I mean, imagine if we walk down the street and we're like, that's a good house builder. Just just do your best to make that. It's like, oh, do I get a blueprint or anything? No, nah, just, just look at it and just, you figure it out, right? Mm. No, and people do that with their own brand and they wonder why then they knock down their website every two years and they ask themselves, where would all my money go? And marketing doesn't work. It's like, it's awful. No, you gotta start, the most important parts of a person and the most important parts of a, of a building are the invisible parts. Yes. And the invisible parts for any brand or person is to look at uh, what are the key messages for your, your business or for yourself. And that is the pain and the villain that's in our life and what is our desire, what's our want. The number one thing is looking at your customer and putting them as the hero, not making yourself the hero. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people make the mistake of making themselves a hero where they're on billboards and, and um, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, no, that's not what people, no, 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 what does your client want? Mm. What what issues, what's their villain and how can you be the guide? Yeah. So if brands and businesses want to learn one thing is be the guide, not the hero. Yes. Make your client the hero. Yes. I want to congratulate you for um, your nomination for Australian of the Year. Yeah. That's you. huge. It was, yeah, it was pretty <laughs> What went through your mind when you first uh, heard about that? I wasn't expecting it. But at the same time, I, I was putting a lot of work in invisibly. Yeah. No, I wasn't doing it to be publicised at all. So it, was, it was a special feeling when you're not expecting it. Yeah. Mm. Well, that's what happens when you change people's lives, hey? Mm. Yeah. Yes, and so true. you've been speaking to the youth for some time now as mm -hmm. well. Um, did you play music to them? I did. That's how I first started. <laughs> I remember um, my mentor at the time, he, this guy named Darren, he was a youth pastor and he was speaking in schools as a not-for-profit. Not about Christian stuff, but more about goal setting. And he saw me play one time. He's like, do you want to come and play some music in front of 
high school. And I thought, like, yeah, might as well. I mean, I was 19. And I'm like, this is a good opportunity to be able to get in front of a thousand kids. And, yeah. But I, when I did it, I realized how much I loved it. And I saw how lost so many of these kids were. They were so open and so hungry for for truth and for role models yes. and for another way. And Darren, we were, travel, we were traveling to Tamworth one time and he, we both discovered that we were both adopted too. And he, he was the one who encouraged me to share my adoption story and to start speaking. And so he was the one who really launched me into this path of yeah. public speaking and helping youth. Yeah. yeah. If you were to think about some of the youth who have had some of the challenges you went through, mm-hmm. um, ident- questions of identity, uh, parental conflict, mm-hmm. um, displacement, what is some advice that you would give them? in this location now? Um, I think I'd say honour your feelings, mm. validate those feelings, and the questions that you have about life, I mean, they're, they're a lifelong pursuit. Like I, I, I was eight or seven when I was asking these questions, and yeah. I know kids are that profound when they go through yes. foster care or whatever, whatever path they're on. I'd say also keep questioning, question everything that's popular. Because Mark Twain said that everything that's popular is wrong. <laughs> yeah. So everything about <laughs> what's beautiful, what, what's, what's pretty, you know, what's successful is generally wrong, right? I'd also say life is more than just obviously the external, like there's a spiritual pursuit. Everything's a spiritual thing. And I think... Um, I found faith when I was like 12, 13 years old. That what, really what helped me. What faith was that? I was through Christianity. Yes. Yeah, and and that really helped me get through a lot of tough times, and it gave me a, a doctrine or a a guideline for life, and that really helped me get through tough times, and also gave me meaning in life. Yeah. Uh, so if you can find something like that, and, and I know the difference between having it and not having it. Mm. And it can be it lasts a very lonely place when you don't have something bigger than yourself to be able to pursue or to to render your need to. Yeah, I I agree. Mm-hmm. Just to expand the um uh the, our, the dimension of our thinking, mm-hmm. that there is more to life than this three D existence. Mm-hmm. That there is so much more, whether that be spirit, spirituality, faith, and you are also um, a marriage celebrant. Yeah, <laughs> I've been. See, uh, this so how thing. long were you doing that for? Uh, about three years. Okay. And I mean, that's the thing Like, some people, they ask me, how did you get to where I am? And some people would assume maybe the same as you, like you've been doing this for a long time, like your whole life. I've evolved so much. I was a musician. Yes. And then speaker. And then I went to, and it, it just came about because I was playing a lot of weddings as a musician. And I saw, I was already speaking around and I saw like, oh man, celebrants are so boring celebrants to me like that there, there, there's no one under the age of 60 <laughs> doing this and um yeah I'm like, i could do such a good job with this you know and i wanted to marry my friends and family particularly yeah so what what amazing. a joyful thing to do yeah yeah it's, it's it, it was a special it was a special time and then i got to the point where like, i have to choose what I, I have to choose between this this and this my time is so limited the, the more successful you become the more you realize You've got to say yes less yeah. to things and even to to good things, good opportunities. I just can't clone myself three times, four times. <laughs> <laughs> so for all these careers, Matt, um, makes you more of a, uh, how would I call it, this del- delicious, all these delicious layers that make you the man you are today. If I were to ask you, what are some high highs for you and what are some low lows? Mm-hmm. Um, some high highs are, I guess, working toward a goal to be able to provide and, and have a lifestyle and the freedom for my family that I never had as a kid. That was yeah. always a beautiful goal I had to, it wasn't a materialistic goal, it was more just changing my history, yes. changing my family legacy. 
And, that, and that's the thing, uh, in, uh, in ancient times, they would have called it generational curses, mm. where um, family would pass on bad habits or bad things, and they'll call them curses back then, like alcoholism or, or poverty or bad choices or whatever it was. And for my line, there has definitely been that, like for my, my family. And um, I'm proud to be able to say I've changed that. Yeah. And that's... That's, that's, the that's a big side. thing to be proud of, man. <laughs> yeah. You know, he, we, as we heal the past, mm -hmm. we heal the present, which therefore heals the future, mm -hmm. which goes back to healing the past because it's all, it all connects in the, um, in the lineage, hey? Um, mm. I love that. And are you giving your music to your beautiful daughters? Yeah, yeah, I'm giving them... As well as all these life lessons? The, mm -hmm. same, the same opportunities that are... are, are they're, they've got create, They've got the music in How them. old are they now? Six and three. <laughs> They're just beautiful. Cute! I oh, know, they so cute. <laughs> Look at your face change. <laughs> oh, no, I know. I'm so in love. So in love. <laughs> Very good. Um, Isla and River. River. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful names. Mm -hmm. Well done. Well done. And um, it's good when we can look back at our lives and use it as an anti model, huh? Mm. So that our children don't experience the same. Yeah, that's, that was the goal. And I've, I feel like I've got to that place now where we, I've definitely changed a lot of the, 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 the bad stuff repeating itself. Yeah. Matt, we were at dinner one time and you told me this beautiful story that took my breath away about um, Joseph and his multicolored coat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I love the profundity of your stories and the insights that you give. Please, can you tell me that story again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I love the Joseph story. It's a biblical story. And I feel like I am Joseph in the giftings he had. Basically, Joseph was the youngest son and he had 12 brothers. He had a gift. His gift was he had dreams and he could interpret other people's dreams. And his dad made him a very colourful coat. Like it showed his favourite favour and his love toward his son. And... He, Joseph had a dream one day about everyone bowing to him, like his, his brothers, his father, the whole nation of Egypt was bowing to him. And being a young man, he kind of boasted about the dream. Hey, bros, I just like, had a dream, you were bowing to me. And they're like, oh, I'm so jealous. You know, look at him, like, he's, the, our father's, he's the father's favorite son, and now he's, he's really up himself now. And they sold him to slavery. Mm. They threw him, they totally left him and they lied about what happened to him, obviously to the father. The father thought he had died. And so he was sold into slavery and he was bought by a military leader uh, who was under Potiphar. Um, and I think it was actually Potiphar. And basically he had to wash and clean and, and basically just be a slave for this guy's mansion. But Joseph, no matter where he was put, he, he prayed to God and honoured God. And he said, no matter where I'm put, I'm going to work the best I can and be the best damn cleaner. So he would stay over time. He'd work really hard. And Potiphar saw his, his loyalty and his hard work and favoured him. He said, okay, well, and he gave him more responsibility, more responsibility to the point where he was in charge of all his affairs, his, his assets, his investments and everything, his slave of his. And God favoured him and honoured him as he honoured God. And um, his wife, Potiphar's wife, um, looked at Joseph with envy and um, with, not, not, not with envy, but with lust, actually. And um, she went to, you know, like, sleep with him. But he was like, I can't, he, I can't do that. I can't dishonor my master. And, and she was pretty violent with him. Like, she tore his uh, cloth, his, um, his robe, and he ran away, bolted. And then she made up a story about how he tried to force himself on her. It was the other way around. So again, he, Joseph was sold again, out, sold out, mm. and Potiphar put him in prison. And like, oh, what? how could it get worse for Joseph? And Joseph had every right now to be like, why? Like, this, yeah. is, this is not fair. And he still honored God no matter where he's put. And he was the best prisoner he could, he, out of all the prisoners. And he had favor with the prison guards and prison wards. And walked around eventually wherever he wanted to. and interpreted dreams and helped people with whatever rations he had. And there were two people in prison one day 
who had dreams and he interpreted both dreams. In one person's dream, he said, you're going to leave here and be the cup bearer of the king. And I want you to remember my dream and my gift and tell the king. He's like, okay, I'll remember. And he got out, the dream happened and, the, and he got out of prison and he forgot to mention Joseph <laughs> for a long time mm. until the king had these terrible nightmares about this this vision that was happening in the you know like there was all these things happening and none of his wisest counsel could explain what the dream was about and then the cupbearer remembers oh this is guy in prison and he interpreted my dream so the king uh, summoned joseph to him and joseph interpreted king's dream mm. and the in the king's dream was basically there were seven cows and seven monsters and the, the seven cows were eaten by the seven monsters and Joseph was saying basically the seven cows are seven years of plenty. You're going to have great fam- uh, great, great years of, of harvesting. But then the monsters is seven years of, of famine. Yes. And you're going to have to put... Uh, my suggestion for you is to tax people certain grain, certain things, and we'll store it away in the seven years. So when the famine hits, we're going to have reserves. And then that's when... The king actually appointed Joseph as the prince of everything. So his dream from the start of everyone bowing to him actually came and true. true. But it's his ability to interpret people's dreams mm. and honor God through no matter where he was put, no matter what happened to him, he decided within me, I will not let anyone take away my freedom to choose how I respond. Yes. And now I resonate with that so much because I have that same gift. Yeah. No matter who I work with or where I've gone to, I've been able to interpret dreams of That's your creative genius. <laughs> yeah, that's my creative genius. I work with kings and queens for that reason. Yes. And uh, that's where I find myself most days now is in the, the presence of these types of people. Like you're a queen in my eyes, right? You're a king in my eyes, my dear friend. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean that, by the way. Mm, I mean that. Um, I can see why you resonate with Joseph, being mm. able to adapt to any environment, Mm -hmm. stepping up with integrity Mm -hmm. and living your truth, living Mm -hmm. your truth, and then also being in service of everyone around you. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful, wonderful story. Thank you for telling it to me again. (laughs) (laughs) I love listening to stories. Mm -hmm. Matt, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for having me. I want to give you a gift. All right. And I also want to ask you two last questions. Okay. First, let me give you the gift. Wow. <laughs> Dear Matt, you smell no. <laughs> There's three of them for you and your crew. Oh wow. <laughs> now this is delicious truly. Two fun questions. Yeah. What have you spent less than one hundred dollars on, dear Matt, that has made a massive impact to your life? I think a moleskin. Yes. Definitely like the diary. I, I, I'm a tech head too, but yeah. I think I'm getting analog is so good. Yes. Analog is so <laughs> good for the. I'm so analog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> analog all the way. And, uh, things like like pe- good pen. Yeah. And a moleskin. Oh, I mean, that's that's worth its weight in gold. Very um, good. Yeah, I, I can't think the same way and execute things the same way on a, on an iPad or a yeah. on a computer. Uh, I yeah. love that because you have a you own a production company which is all tech. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm going analog. My last question is: What makes Matt Purcell purr? Oh, I really mean this. I'm actually so grateful to be alive. Yeah. Like I, well, if I look back at my history, my birth mother um, didn't know she was pregnant until she hit labour. My next door neighbour in Korea. Gave, delivered me on the barn floor, wasn't a doctor. And she could have just like got rid of me or she could have aborted the whole process because it would have brought sh- shame to her. And the fact that I was chosen by two Australian parents, who I do dearly love, are giving me a second chance, I was chosen. It gives me such a, a reason to live. Yeah. Because I'm so I'm so grateful to be here. Me too. Uh, yeah. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, boy. Ah. All the best. Thank you for being with me today. Oh, darling. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Beautiful man.